Traditionally, in the closing session, we hear from someone whose work has been honoured with the Wise Prize for Education, and that is the case again today. Someone whose entire mission, whose life's work, has been to educate girls in Africa. So please welcome this year's Wise Prize for Education laureate, Anne Cotton. Your Highness, Sheikh Amosa bin Nasser, Chairperson of the Qatar Foundation. Your Excellency, Dr. Abdullah bin Ali Al Thani, Chair of WISE. Fellow delegates, in the little world in which children have their existence, whoever brings them up, there is nothing so keenly felt or so keenly perceived as injustice. These are the words of Charles Dickens, writing great expectations 150 years ago. His finely attuned sense of injustice infuses all his novels and especially the circumstances of his childhood characters who have witnessed the crossing of time and seas to enlarge human imagination and compassion. In his afternoon walks around London, Dickens met children who were experiencing a force of neglect and punishment that they were powerless to change. And in our own 21st century, millions of children still endure childhoods without the resources and opportunities that are the foundation for a secure and happy life. Education is the right of every child. It is fundamental to their development and to their welfare. We are gathered at the WISE Summit because every one of us knows and believes this. We are here to learn and to imagine what is possible and to unite to create a world that gives every child an extended quality education. My professional experience is in rural Africa. Imagine life through the eyes of a poor girl. Every morning, you get up in the dark to haul water home. You help your mother fan the embers of yesterday's fire to cook breakfast. As daylight grows, you watch friends from better off homes make their way to school, and you wonder, what would it like to be like them? But then you think this will never happen, and that your only future is early marriage, early childbirth, and a life of endless days with a heavy round of domestic and agricultural chores. Who might this girl have become? Multiply her loss of education by the loss to tens of millions of girls out of school, and the impact in human misery is incalculable. It is a global catastrophe. We see it in child mortality, maternal mortality, food insecurity, and fragile economies. The exclusion of girls from education is neither neutral nor passive in its impact, and it is manifestly unjust. How then do we restore justice? How do we catalyze education for girls? How do we unlock the transformative power of girls' education, whose benefits hold a positive multiplier like no other. Let me share some of what we have learned. Come back with me to 1991, when girls' exclusion from education was seen as an intractable problem, and one in which cultural resistance on the part of poor parents to the education of their daughters was perceived as being at the root. I went to the village of Mola in Zimbabwe to study this problem to a community where there were seven boys for every girl at secondary school. And the community, the parents, the teachers, the chief, with one voice gave me their answer, poverty. Their decisions 
did not spring from any traditional culture, but from a depth of poverty in which choice is an illusion. When every spending decision has a bearing on survival itself, boys' education was favored over girls because they had the best chance of paid work. They could go to the commercial farms and fisheries and bring money back to the family. Those families' decisions made sense, but they were misunderstood by many of the experts in the field. And this misunderstanding became the accepted knowledge upon which education initiatives were planned. A heavy investment was made in persuading poor families to act in a way that was quite simply not possible. We must reject the unspoken premise that the poor are somehow different, an amorphous mass that makes incomprehensible decisions, that irritate those who think they know. Why can't the poor make responsible decisions, some experts ask. Poor parents share the universal desire for education for their children. No family in our experience has ever turned down educational support for their daughter. Not one. And because this is so, Camford has worked for more than two decades in partnership with poor families, transforming this desire for girls' education into reality. The community of MOLA also taught me about the different dimensions of poverty. The material marks were all too apparent in the patched huts, the swollen stomachs of children, and the thin frames of adults. Yet what of the invisible psychological marks? To be poor is to live in a constant state of anxiety. Nothing is secure, nothing is assured. The human imagination is reduced to an obsession with money and how to get small, very small amounts that can halt a family's fall into complete destitution. Imagine the psychological impact on a mother as she watches her child cry for want of food. Imagine the fear of mothers and fathers as they watch for late rains that they hope will bring the next harvest. Imagine a family that takes their sick son to the rural clinic in a wheelbarrow, but then refuses to allow him to go to hospital because they are afraid that he will die there. And if he does, they will not be able to afford to bring his body home. I met this family in Mola after their eight-year-old son had died. These lessons about the dehumanizing burden of poverty form the foundation of Camford's model for girls' educational inclusion. Inclusion is one of the keys to our program success. We invite poor communities to be our partners, and we build those partnerships around the girl. And in recognizing the psychological impact of poverty, we build programs that reflect back to each girl her intrinsic importance. We measure her carefully for uniforms that fit. We give her sturdy shoes. We follow her academic progress. We don't exclude her for poor performance, and we act swiftly to support her if she is ill. And in this behavior, we publicly affirm that each girl is entitled to our respect and service. This commitment raises a girl's status in her own eyes, a fundamental step in her path out of poverty. Does this sound idealistic to you? Some years ago, when I explained our model to an audience, someone made the statement, it sounds wonderful, but this high-touch approach can't be scaled. Not so. Since 1993, more than three million children and young people have benefited from CAMFED programs at primary, secondary, and tertiary levels across Ghana, Malawi, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And in October this year, CAMFED was officially recognized by the OECD as a model of best practice in taking education innovation to scale. The world has proved enough times 
that it can scale cruelty and violence. Compassion and kindness must be scaled to create a world of justice for children. Let me describe how. Camford's impact extends beyond girls' education. We help communities develop the thing they need most, rich new sources of capital. Knowledge capital that is critical for programs to work pre-exist Camford's work in the community. Grandmothers who are heading households, they hold vital knowledge about the psychological effects of death of someone close on themselves and on the children they care for. Camford's task is to create the opportunities that will enable them to share their knowledge, including having the confidence that they will be respected and listened to carefully. Two weeks ago, I was in Malawi, and I visited one of the 176 preschools that we support. In the early morning, 10 local mothers were preparing and serving nutritious porridge to 70 small children, something they do every day from Monday to Friday. I asked the mothers if they thought that some of the children were more vulnerable than others. Yes, one replied. We can see those who are the most hungry by the way they eat, and we give them extra. Only the mothers in this community would have the knowledge to detect in little children's behavior these signs of deprivation and act immediately. Institutional capital is also recognized by Camford, and we work with existing structures such as government schools and clinics, chieftaincies and their courts, and faith-based leaders and their mosques and churches. Camford also catalyzes the emergence of new institutions. Community development committees, for example, were conceived as a joined-up system of local government officers and community activists ensuring that the knowledge and power of all constituencies is brought to the table to educate and advance girls' education. They all contribute as volunteers. And perhaps the greatest evidence of the impact of our work is the institution of CAMA, an alumni network of all the secondary school graduates. It provides a forum in which young women can grow their decision-making and leadership capabilities. How do elites consolidate their power? Through their alumni. And this is what we have created for one of the most disadvantaged social groups in the world today, girls in rural Africa. Let me share Camford's genesis. When in 1998, Lucy Lake, my colleague of 20 years and now Camford's chief executive officer and I realized that the first groups of girls graduating from secondary education faced a dangerous transition into young adulthood. We examined the problem with the girls themselves. CAMA was born by the first 400 girls to complete secondary education with Camford's support. Today, CAMA has 24,436 members across Ghana, Malawi, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. They are Muslims and Christians. They speak around. Thank you. Well, they are Muslims and Christians. They speak around 30 different languages, and from this broad background, they share a broad vision. In their own words, they are united by a background of rural poverty and the determination to transform their communities. They have delayed marriage and motherhood. Their example as role models is having a powerful impact. In Malawi, for example, 5% of the young women who have received Camford bursaries have become mothers, compared to 27% nationally in the same age group. Each Kama member was once a barefoot child, unable to say her name with confidence. Angeline Moromirwa was top in her district's primary school exams but her parents could not afford to send her to secondary school. Neighbors sympathized with their disappointment. It's a shame. Those who have too many pumpkins don't have the pots to cook them. 
She was supported by Camford throughout her adolescence and young adulthood. She is now Camford's Regional Executive Director in Africa. And she is leading the delivery of the UK's investment to support 139,000 girls in secondary education in Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Tanzania. In 1993, Ronyararo Machingaidzi wrote to me of her longing for education. If only I get a chance, I will do something great. Today, she is Dr. Machingaidzi. She is a doctor in Namibia. Patricia Mangoma set up a small rural business with a grant from CAMFED. Its early profits supported her brothers and sisters to go to school. She employed young people in her community. Patricia supported the creation of CAMFED's seed money program. It's now in place across five countries and has so far led to the establishment of almost 10,000 businesses. Patricia is with us here today. Angeline, Ronyararo, Patricia, they are just three of the 24,436 CAMA members. Others are winning awards and accolades. Ruka Yaro de Liman, a leading CAMA member in Ghana, was honored with a Mandela Washington Fellowship at President Obama's Young African Leaders Summit just three months ago. And Abigail Kayundu sits on the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's Youth Advisory Group for Education. <laughs> CAMA's collective power grows exponentially. Members are supporting at least two or three children beyond their extended family. 2,033 are learner guides improving the quality and relevance of education in rural schools, powerful role models for the next generation. More than 154,000 people have been trained by CAMA in financial literacy, which leads me to financial capital. This includes training in financial management, critical to the eradication of poverty. How can communities grow their decision-making around financial resources if they're not allowed to handle them? This risk-averse practice infantilizes poor people and undermines their confidence and trust. In our program, everyone in the community knows how much and when money will arrive. Everyone is accountable to the child the financial resources are dedicated to them and protected for them. Our financial systems are extremely tight, designed by Luxon Shumba, our finance director, and linked to our data monitoring system so that we can track investments as well as school enrollment and retention. Let's return to Charles Dickens. He never got over the shame at the fact that when his father went to prison, for being unable to pay his debts, he became a child laborer in a blacking factory. His biographer only revealed these details two years after his death. Dickens understood poverty because he had lived it. Poverty creates embarrassment and shame. Kama members understand this, but they have transformed these marks of poverty into pride and empathy. Pride in their own and their families' struggles. And empathy for those who are like they once were. They are moving into health and education institutions and transforming them from within. Dr. Ranyararo Machingaidzi said to me, when I'm at the hospital and I see a nurse being unkind to a poor woman, I say to her, don't speak to that woman that way. She could be my mother. And she is shocked.
because she does not think that her doctor in a white coat was from a poor rural home. And to remember the little girl we imagined as I began, as we gather here, she does not know that the wise prize that I am honored to receive will transform her future in a way that she cannot begin to imagine. She does not know that her step across the threshold of a classroom will be a step for justice. We are committing to support one million more girls through secondary education over the next five years. Their latent transformative power will then become real. They will transform the lives of generations to come. Your Highness, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, join them. There is no time to lose. Thank you.